I'm really excited to share some of my thoughts on generative models right now. So right now, generative models are one of the hottest things uh, in machine learning as well as in the startup scene. So in the past couple months, uh, there's been this proliferation of text to image AI generators. So if you give like a prompt like an astronaut riding a horse in a photorealistic style, you get this really stunning image in like less than 10 seconds. And you can do all types of different prompts, you can do different art styles, and you can get all types of different images. Uh, but what I really talk about in this talk is how this is just one of the possible applications of generative models. So instead of just images, there are so many other possibilities that you could use gener generative models for, some of which I've been exploring and which I will detail more. So the first thing we can imagine that we can use generative models for is not just generating art, but actually understanding images. So what we can do is we can take an image of the real world, such as an image of a, uh, of a cat, and then what we can do is we can try to infer the text that we can input into the generative model so that we can actually generate the image we want. And you can imagine that you can do all types of different images and you can really like understand what is going on in the visual world. Another thing you can imagine that you can do with generative models is the idea of decision making. What you can do is you can take hundreds of millions of demonstrations of how you can move in the world, like how you can pick up something or how you can walk into a room. And what you can do is then you can uh, tell, the, tell this generative model, given what I see in the moment, uh, do a particular behavior that, sat, that, that I've seen in the past. For example, generate a trajectory that can stack a red block on top of a purple block and a blue block on top of a red block. You can also imagine that you can fit generative models on the millions of drugs that we've synthesized in the world right now. And then once you, uh, and once, you have the, uh, once you have this learned generative model, you can just specify what you want. Maybe something that binds to a particular uh, receptor or something with a particular sequence. And, it can, and you can really quickly design a drug for the domain on hand. And normally this is a really expensive process, which costs like billions of dollars and many years of progress. But you can imagine that this can greatly reduce your search space and potentially lead to many, uh, very fast cures to many types of diseases. Another thing you can imagine you could do with generative models is the idea of program synthesis. We've written millions and billions of lines of code on the internet. And you can imagine that you can train that generative model on all of these lines of code. And now once you have this model, you can just directly from the model generate the HTML of a web page or generate a, a bot that uh, interacts with the internet or, or basically construct an application that can do the thing you want it to do. You can imagine that you could use this for reasoning also. You, uh, there, are, you, there are hundreds of thousands of proofs on the internet, starting from the theorem to, the direct, to, to how you prove this result and the final result. And maybe just by using these generative models, you could generate many possible different theorems and, addition, and new, potentially new mathematical insights. And you could also potentially t take the hundreds of millions of uh, search results on the internet and, use, and fit a single generative model to this. And then once you have this generative model, you can prompt it with a question you want. And the generative model can just kind of search up in the hundreds of thousands of documents it's learned and give you the answer on hand. So this gives you a really fast way to immediately get the result you want. And really, this is, uh, this is just a couple applications. There are, I've intentionally left one blank because there's like hundreds of thousands of other applications that you could potentially do with generative models. So now what I'll talk about is I'll talk about a couple of these applications in a bit more detail, uh, as well as what I've been doing working along in this direction. So first, let's consider the problem of using these generative models for perception, for essentially understanding the images that you see every day, on a day-to-day -day basis. What you can do is imagine you have an image of two dogs right now. What you can do is you can take one of these text-to-image models and you can just input a, 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 a sentence, an image of a person, and then it will just synthesize the image. And you can see the extent to which the synthesized image can actually match the real image you've given it. And if your text is incorrect, chances are you can't really synthesize this real image. And you can try various variations of this text, like an image of a cat, and you'll still get uh, incorrect synthesis. But when you actually specify the correct object, for example, an image of a dog, then you'll be able to correctly generate the image on hand. So really, this gives you a method to like basically take an image of the real world and basically infer whatever subject is inside the image. You can also imagine that you can use this for action. What you can do is imagine you have an image of a person surfing. By, just, by prompting and writing a sentence, a person walking, you can again see if you can synthesize the image that you've been given on hand. 
And by actually, uh, by, uh, by correctly entering the right action, a person surfing, then you can correctly synthesize the image. So like this gives you a really a free form way to understand a variety of images. You can like take the new, uh, take an image of your bedroom that you're in currently, and then you can kind of just get a test, text description of what is actually in the bedroom directly from these generative models. So one of the limitations of the models currently is that they seem to not really have a good uh, understanding of a common sense. So if you give these models a large blue metal cube in front of a large cyan metal cylinder and a large blue metal cube on the left of a small metal sphere, then these models don't really generate something sensible. They only generate two objects. And one underlying issue is that they aren't really compositional in nature. And they may like, and they're not able to generate things that are that different than the things they train on. But actually, that actually isn't the biggest problem. Uh, because some of our work that we found is there's, it's relatively easy to actually get these models to be uh, a bit more compositional in nature. And the idea is that each of these models really specifies a type of probability distri distribution. So basically it says, these images have high likelihood and these images have low likelihood. And what you can do is you can really compose different generative models together to really generate very complicated uh, text phrases that are compositional in nature. For example, let's say I want to generate, uh, generate a scene, a horse, either on a sandy beach or a grassy beach where the weather is not sunny. What you can do is instead of using a single generative model to generate this image, you can compose a series of four different generative models. You can use a pro a rules of probability to like really like co combine each of these models together, and then you can just ge directly sample from these models. And as an, example, uh, as an example of what I was talking about earlier, you can see by just composing different models together, you can go from an image of a horse to something much more complicated, like a horse uh, either in a sandy beach or a grassy plains where the weather is not sunny. And you can also go back to the setting where I talked about earlier, where, the, uh, where like with directly just with a single generative model, you can't generate these very complicated uh, scenes that are, that are in common sense. But with two of these models, you can actually correctly generate something. So again, if you look at the prompt, a large blue metal cube in front of a large cyan metal cylinder, you now see that that relation is correctly specified. And again, a large blue metal cube on the left of a small metal sphere is again correctly specified. So essentially, these generative models, you can actually build in some type of this compositional structure and be able to generate more uh, combinations of data that you haven't really seen in your training set by just like using the rules of probability. Another thing you can imagine that you can really do for this, uh, you, you do using these models, is the idea of decision making. So the idea is, can you synthesize a behavior, uh, particular behaviors using these models? In, d in this particular case, I'll talk a bit about uh, stacking blocks. So what we want to do is this robot arm is going to stack a black block uh, on a blue block and a purple block on top of a red block. And the way that the system works is you essentially just compose multiple models again. So you have a single model that specifies different ways that in which you may stack blocks. And you have two other individual models that specify orders in which you can stack, uh, uh, in which blocks should be stacked. And by combining both of these models together, you now have generated a stack of blocks with a particular desired order that you wish to take. Another setting you can imagine is the setting of protein design. So in protein design, you often want to design a particular protein, which maybe has a particular type of shape, uh, in particular so that you can bind to a receptor in a cell, while also maybe having some type of sequence makeup so that it can, be, uh, it can, so it can fold more fe feasibly, as well as other different specifications you want. And one thing you can do is you can imagine that you can, again, compose different models. You can have one model that specifies how likely, how, how reasonable a sequence is, and other models that specify like each aspect of structure you want. So by combining different models together, you could potentially design pro, uh, completely new proteins. And this setting is very useful because, as I discussed earlier, protein design is a very uh, is a very hard process and requires like a large amount of engineering, uh, as well as like uh, many millions of dollars. And by potentially by using such systems that can just directly learn to design proteins, you could uh, save a lot of the money. Uh, needed for experimentation. And these are some of the, uh, and, and again, these are some of these compositions can be more broadly applied to a large, uh, large number of other settings. In the setting of program synthesis, you can imagine 
that you can generate proteins with particular con combinations of attributes you want. For example, maybe you wanted to, on one hand, be a reasonable program, but also specify, satisfy different specifications, like communicating with a particular website, as well as being able to download data in a particular folder or something like this. Like, you can construct all, ty all types of specifications. Uh, and you could also imagine that you could apply this to reasoning. Maybe you want to prove a particular equation or formula. You can imagine that you can specify the formula you want to prove. Maybe then you can specify the particular techniques you want to use to prove it. And you can basically generate proofs of particular natures and styles. You could also imagine that you could synthesize different types of materials with this approach. Again, we've like over the over the several hundreds of years, we've designed all types of different complicated materials for the different uh, uh, applications we need. And you can imagine that maybe you want to generate a new type of material that's both light, maybe it's bulletproof, maybe it's uh, maybe it's easy to synthesize. Like you have all these properties, and you can imagine you can fit like a generative model to all of these individual prob uh, properties, and then you can like compose and multiply the probability distributions across these generative models to design particular materials to have a combination of all these properties. And in a likewise manner, you can imagine that like, if you want to retrieve information, one approach could be to fit a single generative model across all the information you wish to retrieve. But you can also imagine that by composing multiple sets of models, you, could use all the, uh, you can use each model together, the information specified in each model together, to more finely retrieve and fetch the information you want to do. But really, in conclusion, I, I mean, these are just like some applications of generative models and maybe some of the composition operators I've talked about. But really, I think the big thing is these generative models are not just useful for images, but actually for a variety of different downstream tasks. Thank you. <laughs>